Cool. Hello, everyone um, who is here to join us today for Nonfiction Book Club. Um, how do we do this usually? We do an intro. Um, so yeah. yes, this is this is Nonfiction Book Club. I am Deboki, and you are on my channel at Okie Doki Boki. Um, I am a science writer slash communicator. Um, my my uh, my experience is largely in biology and not physics, which is going to be irrelevant when we get into our book for today, <laughs> um, because there's a lot of a lot of question marks, but. Um, yeah, that is my background um, in terms of the science side, um, but I do spend my time Googling a lot of science. And so sometimes I have to learn about quantum and gravity stuff for like a few seconds and then it leaves my mind. Um, but with me is Nicole from Sweeney Says. I also, I know nothing at all about physics. Um, uh, is a, Oh, you know, I just had the thought actually, I bought, um, when I, so I, I'm a video producer. That's just my introduction. I, that's what I do for a living. Um, I produce educational videos and, uh, when I first started working on crash course, I, uh, didn't we were working on anatomy and physiology and astronomy were the two things that we were doing uh, anatomy and physiology truly did not understand anything that was happening like I stood in the room and I was like I don't know man uh, epithelial uh, I can tell you a lot of terms um, but what any of them mean nothing astronomy I like started out like okay I kind of understand this and then not at all and so after that the next two things that we started I bought a book for each of the next two courses because I was like I'm gonna have knowledge and then I never opened them so somewhere around here I have um uh, a like it was like I don't know I googled like physics like if you I don't know anything about physics like yeah. hot, hot physics type books uh and I just remembered that I own that that I I never opened it never never <laughs> <laughs> never touched it so anyway um that's I my background is in sociology um, and a bachelor's in sociology and a master's master's in communications. So people stuff that's my jam. Uh, science <laughs> and physics is not people. Just for the record, <laughs> <laughs> physics is too much away from the people. I, I'm mm -hmm. sure the physicists disagree. Um, so I apologize in advance. Um, but the reason why we keep on talking about physics and our lack of knowledge thereof is because today we're going to be talking about. Um, the End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, um, by Katie Mack. Um, so this is a book about the end of everything, astrophysically speaking. It's about the physics of the universe and basically how there are all of these different ways that our universe could end. Some are billions of years away in possibility, and some of them are more... Uh, I don't want to say like likely to happen anytime, but kind of that's sort of the message I got is that they could like if they are a thing that could happen, they could then happen at just about any time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is written by Katie Mack, uh, or Dr. Katie Mack. She's a theoretical astrophysicist um, out of North Carolina State University. So she does like the, the astrophysics stuff, but she also does a lot of like science writing, science communication stuff. She's on Twitter at Astro Katie, and this was a new release. So I was like pretty interested in it because I feel like astrophysics is a thing that to me is just a word at, at, at a certain point where I was like, I don't know if I could tell you completely what that means. I know that there is the astro and there is the physics. Mm. Um, and I don't, I know what those words mean individually, but you put them together and I can like approximate it. <laughs> but can I tell you what it is? Hmm, no. Um, yeah, so I, I'm curious what your, um, like you said, you, you, you had the physics books in your, <laughs> in your house and yeah. that is your physics. Uh-huh, yep, physics books I've never touched. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know, man, like I, I, I think, I find all of this stuff super interesting. Um, I astrophysic like astro, like the astronomy. So like I said, like uh, my my the time that I spent working on crash course astronomy, super interesting. I understood maybe a third of it, but like was fascinated by the third that I understood, and then the other two thirds. There were a lot of really cool pictures, so that was great, uh, and like that was sort of my experience. But once you like the at you bring the physics into it and like yeah. you do that. I, yeah, I don't know, man. I yeah. will say in spite of that, um, this, 
I had and the experience reading this was in some ways similar to the experience that I had reading um, the microbiome book. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I contain multitudes. I contain multitudes. Um, in that, like that, also I had the experience of like he's doing. He's explaining something right now that I do not understand, and I'm like, I'm like, kind of gl like mentally glossing over this section. Mm -hmm. But then we're gonna bring it back around to like I I'll get I'll get a gist of something from that. Um, only like less like or more I had that more here like yeah. in, in the in that book I felt like the the stretches where I spent confused <laughs> were <laughs> shorter um whereas with this it was like okay this is like pages and pages of, of physics and I maybe yeah. sort of like caught something but also but like I can tell you I can give you you know like a one to two sentence summary of the different you know ends of the you like I get the gist of it yeah but any of all of her explanations of how it works I have I have no idea I have no yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes I I'm so I have like I have taken like quantum class. I mean I've taken like like in an engineering school the quantum classes that are geared towards like freshmen so I've like under, like I've learned the basic vocabulary that I'm supposed to know in terms of the words and the equations, but it's been a long time, first of all. And second of all, I got by on like pass fail in some of these cases or like really just by the skin of my teeth. Um, I feel like quantum is like one of those things where it's like always fun to think about, but the idea that I have to like apply the words that I've just been taught is like a little bit sketchier. Uh, so as like, as you can tell, if you're watching this, neither of us are going into this with a lot of expertise um but to clarify i also never took a physics class mm. like never uh th yeah my like science background is like very very minimal uh so <laughs> cool so we are all i think with mari jocelyn it seems like we're all in a very <laughs> like a similar place and we're gonna i think what we're gonna do today is we're gonna like really lead into the like physics therapy hour of like processing like what we learned how we learned it uh yeah and what it means for the universe um so i figured the easiest way was just gonna kind of like follow the trajectory of the book itself sort of so we're gonna kind of start with like talking about like as she goes over in the beginning, like kind of how the universe started, because apparently to talk about how the universe ends, we need to first understand how it all got kind of put together. Um, and then go into some of the, uh, the initial kind of grouping of like ways that the universe ends. And then like another sort of like more, what I think of as like the more physics thought experiments approach to think about how the universe ends. But I guess all of these are technically physics thought experiments, which like, Having spoken to like physicists who do these thought experiments all the time, I'm just like, right, this is <laughs> this is the way you guys understand the universe, and it is so foreign to me. <laughs> um, I think like just before we go into it, um, like this book is obviously like she's she's broaching these like really big picture questions, um, and it's kind of like a lot to process. But one of the things that I found really interesting about it is like really she's using the end of the universe to like teach us other concepts in physics which whether or not we, we get it all is like you know going to be a very thing but like i i thought that was like a really interesting approach to the book overall and just kind of that's also how she wraps it up that like really the point of asking these questions is to understand all the intermediates even if we don't know what that ending question actually or ending answer actually is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so with that said um let me make sure i've got like two sets of notes i've got like the big picture summary and then i've got like another thing that's just like all of the things that i feel like i i'm supposed to have learned <laughs> um so starting off with like the history of the universe I, are you like the big bang is a word that i feel like i've heard a lot right yeah like, yeah yeah that, i know that one i know about yeah. it <laughs> i heard about it yeah yeah <laughs> But then, like, there's this whole timeline after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And this, like, is something that came up in, like, work with, for me recently, where, like, someone asked a question about, like, what could you see in the Big Bang? And, like, it turns out you could not see anything for a very long time because the initial Big Bang is just, like, it's really, really, really hot. There's a lot of stuff, but it's just, like, spread out and very hot. And, like, it took... I think like billions of years to get to the point where things c 
came together to form stars. Like that's like how long it took for us to get to like light. Mm -hmm. And that's like a weird thing. Um, but I think one of the things that's interesting to me about this early timeline, there's this so, there's this initial super hot, high energy state. One of the things I didn't know is there's like, apparently all the laws of physics become weird at this point. So like we have like stuff like gravity, there's like a strong nuclear force, like electromagnetism and all this other stuff. And at this early state of the universe, they were all kind of the same, except maybe gravity which is weird, but it's just because of a super high energy. And then eventually the, the the universe starts to inflate, but it also starts to cool down. And then we get particles. And that's like, we get to a certain point where there's like enough, like of a cool temperature and like particles to actually make like normal physics happen. And then that's when we start to get like stars and light and galaxies. And like, that's like what gave rise to the universe. But like what they call, in physics terms, like eras are things that lasted for like fractions of a fractions of fractions of fractions of a second. Yeah, that whole that whole like the time when she was explaining the time of that, that was like that was the the moment that it really clicked for me that I was in for uh, a ride of like <laughs> confusion. Yeah. Uh, I was like, what are you talking about? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes. So very, very wild, wild time scale. Yeah. So there's like this first gut era, which I guess is called, it's the gut era because it's like the grand unified theory era. So I guess it's like when all the forces were the same. Um, and that was, yeah, 10 to the minus 35 seconds long. I don't understand how you call that an era. Like, Especially like, so like thinking about it in terms of like, when we talk about like biology history, like life history, we'll talk about like, you know, we'll compare like all of the history of the earth, like this 4 billion or plus years. And we talk about like how life spanned on it. And then we talk about humans. And like to us, humans have been barely like a mark of time in the history of mm -hmm. the world. But we're still longer than 10 to the minus 35 seconds. We have that going <laughs> for us. So uh, that's one thing. Yeah, I don't know. I but She was also explaining it as like time not meaning what it means. And so that yeah. was, I, I don't know. I like, I didn't. I didn't really dwell on that. That yeah. was like in the section of things that I was like, I don't, you know, uh, yep. you, you're introducing um, units of time that don't make sense to me, but you're also telling me that like time didn't really make sense in this. Yeah. Uh, so yep. I'm going to, I'm going to choose to just, okay. That's information yeah. that I, I took in and. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I think like the other the other side of this that's like weird and it's everything with this stuff is like if I think I get it, I that's like I know I didn't get it is like the idea that like when you're thinking about space, time and distance are like the same thing. And this is like a thing that I know because it's like come up enough that I'm like familiar with the concept, but like it's brought up in the beginning with this book and she's talking about how we know about the history of the universe. But I still feel like I don't know. It's just like, I, I, I just I can't imagine like that you have your normal work, your, your normal life, like where you're not a physicist and you're like time, distance, two separate things. But then you like go to work as a physicist and suddenly they are the same. Like a light year is a measurement of time, but also a measurement of distance that like if light has traveled this certain amount of distance, Time, either one. At this point, I don't know which one. It is. That means that you can tell how, like, what you're seeing is actually from X years ago. Mm -hmm. So, in space, time is distance, and distance is time. Yeah, yeah, and like having to having to internalize. Yes, having to think that way uh, in your nine to five job uh, as a. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I, don't, I don't know what uh, uh, a day in the life of a, a physicist <laughs> actor looks like. But uh, and then like you have to go back to your normal life where um, time and time and uh, distance are meaningfully discrete ideas. Yep. <laughs> so uh, please, please do not try to collapse them. I did actually. I stopped. I like. I like had this moment where I like had to like sit and I was like 
like thinking when she was talking about this is a little bit later in the book but the the idea that stuff that is farther away can be brighter than stuff that is closer and i was like i was like okay so like if this is like us and then like at the beginning we're like yeah. here and then they're moving like okay <laughs> yeah and she like actually says like you know if this is confusing maybe bring up some napkins and try and maybe it will make sense eventually <laughs> and i was like yeah yeah, I think that's I, I think that's what I gotta do. <laughs> that's the only way this is gonna make sense to me. Uh huh. Uh huh. Actually, um, that was one of the few things that she one of the few things that I did actually underline. Oh, I found it so easily. Um, I wasn't expecting that because I don't have my little tabs. But oh, this yep. Yeah, beyond a certain point, the balance between the universe was smaller in the past and light takes a certain amount of time to get here is such that the galaxy is more distant. One that a galaxy that is more distant than another galaxy now might have actually been closer when its light was emitted. That was, I like underlined it and then I like proceeded to sit and like try to parse what was being said. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many times where like I read a paragraph in this book and then had to go back to the beginning of the paragraph to be like, okay, did I, did I get that? Um, oh yeah. With that said, um, for those of you watching, if you guys have questions, um, a thing that I have become trained at is Googling these things very efficiently. So if you like don't understand something or like we're talking about something and you want to like try to like figure out more about it, like let us know and we can like tease it out and see if we can figure it out. Because I, I can't. <laughs> but is generously <laughs> me in this problem solving. <laughs> I. I think the more people who are involved in this, the better. Because especially, <laughs> it is so easy for me to lean into like, like I remember I was having a conversation where I was like answering like a question related. And I was like, oh yeah, it's something about the gravitational well potentials. And Hank was like, so Devoki, what's a gravitational well potential? And I was like, well, <laughs> Google. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I find it helpful. Yeah, to I, I will be here to uh, to ask those questions. Exactly. <laughs> to call me out on my bullshit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we've got the universe getting made. It turns out that the Big Bang Theory song was like really, really good for explaining this. Um, we've got universe cooling down, then it's inflating, we're shifting in normal physics, everything's coming together. And so this is kind of her setting the stage for then like, well, if this is how the universe is made, how can it be unmade? Um, and her three, like, I think the next three chapters, like chapters three through five are like sort of like all kind of related because they're all sort of connected to how we understand that the universe is expanding. Um, so there's three ideas. There's one called the big crunch, which is basically that after a certain point, the universe is gonna stop expanding and it's actually gonna begin contracting and that is our crunch um and it turns out that basically if that happens space gets set on fire like i think that's how she described it or i'm paraphrasing it but like that is what will happen is everything gets hit on fire the next one it's heat death um which sounds like everything's getting on fire but is actually more of a weird physics thing of basically it, to cause heat death what's going to happen is that instead of expansion of the universe stopping or slowing down it's actually speeding up and this is like based in part on experimental observations or like how we've been calculating the expansion of the universe and so because it looks like expansion is speeding up um if that then plays out in the long term and it turns out that's actually what's happening what's going to happen is we're going to turn into like a void of radiation which sounds pleasant um and we're going to maximize entropy which is like the disorder that's like kind of everywhere. Um, and so we're gonna like maximize that to the point where time has no meaning, which to me was like a wild concept. <laughs> I was like, okay, I did not know that our sense of time was defined by entropy and disorder, but I guess when you're a physicist, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one was like the oh the last one in this group is the big rip or that's what she's calls in that's um basically based on dark energy which is like 
this field, what was dark energy? I, I keep confusing dark matter versus dark energy. The, so dark matter comes up as a thing that like basically made it possible for galaxies to form. Um, but dark energy is like a field. Oh, dark energy is the field that's responsible for the expansion of the universe and it turns out that if there is like a parameter describing dark energy that is like just slightly off then at some point 100 billion years away from now like everything is going to unravel and that is then going to be how our universe ends um I yeah i fully understand the distinction between that and heat death that I was I got a little bit caught up. I like I understood yeah. that like math was different in in meaningful ways, but I didn't really. I'm like confused. That confused me. Like what? Yeah. What's the distinction between the big rip and yeah, that's a good question because I you're right because like it feels like at that point the point is that we are still just expanding and things are drifting away but like for some reason in the big rip earth explodes and that did not happen in heat death uh True. True. <laughs> <laughs> that is like what i took away from that uh -huh. um, yeah okay yeah sure 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 yes 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 <laughs> um okay that's good i i'll put that in my notes Big rip. <laughs> Earth, earth explodes. explodes. Death. No earth explode. Well, and, um, and I think related to that, the time scale. So thought, wait, 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 wait. I thought she said that in any of these three scenarios, um, uh, the sun will destroy us before any of them happen. I hate, maybe, because there's one, well, so with the, with the big, the other thing that we got to take into account is that we're going to collide with Andromeda, uh -huh. probably, I think, before some of this happens. Wait, like, uh -huh. so I put the time scale. So like, the big crunch is estimated to happen at least tens of billions of years away. Mm -hmm. The big rip is supposed to be about a hundred billion years away and heat death. We don't know when it could happen, just that it could happen far in the future, at least mm -hmm. according to like the way she laid it out. Um, and I think we're supposed to collide with Andromeda. I want to say in 4 billion years. Um, so Andromeda is another galaxy. Ga galaxies are colliding all the time, which is a thing I also did not know until recently because it turns out when they collide, their black holes will like collide with each other. And then they like, that's how like these black holes grow. But sometimes if you have black holes that are like kind of imbalanced, one will actually get kicked out of the galaxy and it's like weird. Um, I don't know, space is like weird. Um, so the other thing that's weird, so, okay, I, I don't know why I'm saying the other thing that's weird. All of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, the one thing in this yeah. that was weird. So, okay, so heat death was kind of like the most interesting one to me because it also led to this universe of just like, everything is just radiation, but she uses that to talk about how like, okay, you're gonna just have like this low temperature radiation world left, but, and, and it creates what that's called, I guess, a desitter space. Um, but because of the way that this universe is left, you could actually then get universes again. Um, and it's based on like the particles that are like remaining and this whole thing of statistical mechanics, which like was a very, long class that I took in, <laughs> in undergrad that I cannot, like basically statistical mechanics is basically a pro applying like probability to like the maximum, like in the universe, as I understand it, like you're just like, everything is a probability and you're just predicting what can happen, just like how particles can be arranged in a state by basically rolling die, but like with fancy math. Um, and, and the point of this is like, at that point in the universe where you just like, have all of this stuff around and like time has no meaning almost like you can get a universe again but then there's this whole physics thought experiment where like well what's easier than making a universe is making a galaxy well what's easier than making a galaxy is making a planet what's easier than making a planet making a brain and so they have this thing called the boltzmann brains and First of all, this is why no one likes physicists because they do these thought experiments, but also like it is a weird thought experiment. It's probably interesting and like useful in some way. <laughs> yeah, this uh, <laughs> Mari's, when you yeah. get, there's a chance you could happen again. Yeah, because this also got into this idea that like we could all just be reliving Tuesday. Like, 
that is a thing that could happen in the universe because probabilities uh-huh. are wild. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's a, it's uh, is it an interesting time to be reading about that idea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you mean you could uh, feel like you're stuck in the same time over and over again? You mean time has no meaning? <laughs> I wonder what that's like. I can't imagine. <laughs> <sighs> okay, I'm going to try to figure out what the difference is between heat death versus <laughs> and, and big, big rip. rip. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the idea of like happening again, yes, super fascinating, super interesting. That kind of stuff was also my favorite part of this book. That, like when I like I understand to your point that she was using all of these things really as a way of like teaching these physics concepts. Um, And I think that that was really great. And if I had more of an interest in physics, I would have appreciated it more than I did. Uh, (laughs) However, I, with my limited interest in physics, um, to put it generously, preferred the, she she did also kind of like when she brought it back around, you know, to the point of like, okay, now I'm starting to get like the gist of what all of that means. Uh, She also paired that with really interesting um, like ideas. Like I I, I don't need to understand anything about uh, like the, the, like the math of how we get to that end of things to be interested in the basic concept that maybe it could be cyclical so maybe it, it collapses and then yeah. it's all over again or or whatever like any of those ideas that she introduced yeah that was really really cool and i i appreciated that when yeah when those moments when they came they were they were well paced throughout uh with yeah. all the, the heavy physics so this reminds me i remember um i think it was like i was at some like awards like science communication like award ceremony at a conference or something and one of the videos that had won or podcast or something was like about how like flies see or like if we had fly eyes what would we see and one of the things that the writers or like the whoever made it they were talking about was like how if you ask a biologist they're never going to give you a definitive answer because like when you're coming from that side, like you you don't want to speculate that way. And you definitely don't want to speculate in public about that way. You don't want to give people like this false idea of like how biology works. Um, but then they were like, well, you know who loves doing this shit is physicists. Like just go talk to the physicists and they will, they will be happy to speculate and like go down this weird like angle of just like yeah let's let's just let's just think about it like what would that be like and I I think that's like a lot of what the experience of this book was like felt like for me because part of it is like they're they're making all of these big picture like speculation things that like I just cannot like imagine doing like from the biology side especially because you're dealing with things like I don't know like cancer like you're not going to make a big picture pro- prognostication about like how cancer is going to go like you like there are people's lives on the line there's like a lot of that stuff some of this is like you know we're billions of years in the future like are people going to be around i don't know <laughs> like, i don't know what living creature is going to be around billions of years in the future like the stakes are both incredibly high and incredibly low so mm-hmm. like there's like room for speculation in a way that's really different um but also i think it's just baked into the field i think they just like I think like this is like kind of part of physics. It's just being like thinking really creatively in this way. Um, yeah. Which um, to Mari asked in the comments how we felt about the end in general, um, and, and like I think like it, that's that is very much like the 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 point that she gets back around to with like th- this this specific branch of physics, right? But like I, I you know to what you are saying, you can kind of. Um, apply that more broadly that like there there is a lot of this is like you're sure you're asking questions about stuff that you probably can't really confirm the answer to because you will not be there uh and even if you could know the answer you can do nothing about it you can't change it like uh, like but the point is that like by thinking through all of this like you arrive at like better understandings of of like of now and like like there's there's there is a, um, a lot to be learned from thinking through all of that and like yeah. spending your time working through that thought and like you know poking holes in it and like you know okay but what about 
Um, and I, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Like, I, I don't know. I thought, I felt yeah. like that was a, a, a good way that, that felt like the appropriate way to end this book. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I definitely agree. Cause especially like a lot of the specifics, like I was like looking up, okay, Wikipedia, tell me about the difference between big rip and heat, heat death. And it's still just basically like, Heat death is death by like, you know, void of radiation and big rip is acceleration caused by dark energy eventually becomes so strong that it completely overwhelms the effects of the gravitational electromagnetic and strong binding forces. Like, okay, Wikipedia, I, sure, like I get that, sure, maybe, I think, you know, but like, like that, like I, that specific stuff, like I'm never gonna be able to like talk with a physicist about like, yeah, like I can engage with your theory. I can engage with like completely your way of thinking, but like, that the steps along the way are really interesting. And just like the creativity, like especially at one point, like Stephen Hawking makes up a particle to like explain black holes or something about like black holes and how they, the gravity does a thing, I guess, or something, or like the way that they might collapse or something. And you're just like, right, like it, it, it as long as you can like explain what it is you're making up, like that is a thing you can do with physics or like with this stuff like they're just like you know we don't have something to explain this so we're going to just make up a constant and that's going to be dark energy and at some point like we're just like that's going to explain it like that's going to explain it away and like that's like really oversimplifying what they're doing but it's just like very wild to me that that's a thing that like you can do and it it, it also seems um like it's it's an incredibly like collaborative process of that too right like the whole yeah. point is to say okay like here's how i'm going to explain it and like it's you you necessarily must be you know explaining it to other people who who understand what you are saying well enough to say to like to you know to poke holes and to counter and to or to bolster it or to say oh like this part of it that you're not quite sure how it works i have an idea here's how it works whatever um and i i don't know that I even as I was not under not always understanding it, I enjoyed those, you know, infusions of like those those pieces of how how science happens. Yeah. 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 And I think that's related to like the other two forms of like universe ending, which I think are like even more just like how weird can physics get? Like so there's one that's called vacuum decay, which is basically just like what if this one small thing that like defines the way that physics works in our universe just like shifted like it just turned into another value and like that would change everything basically like our physics laws wouldn't work anymore we'd all just like fall apart turns out that's probably like the best way to go it's like i think that's the one where she's like the bright side is you're not gonna feel any pain like yeah. you're just gonna everything's just gonna fall apart <laughs> you won't you won't know what i can offer you is uh you won't feel anything yep no so. yeah and that one was actually interesting too because that is related to like real like experiments that she's like talking about in terms of the large hadron collider and like how there were people who were like what if this triggers that and she had to be like you know this is this is what people might be afraid of, but also like we are never ever gonna be able to trigger that like high enough energies to actually cause that to happen. Uh, like like the collider's not gonna do that. Like space has already worked at way higher energies without triggering the end of the universe, at least as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're probably okay. Um, the other one is called, the other form of universe ending is called bounce. And that is basically, this one was helpful because she she included a demo, a practical demo for us to try, which was that you have your left hand and that is our universe. And basically there's another universe and it's it exists because of gravity. Like the whole point is somehow that gravity does not fit in with our laws. And the whole point is that we're gonna have another universe that gravity is somehow leaking into. And every so often these, these universes just collide, like they clap, that's, that's the bounce. Um, and that like is a way for universes to form and also get destroyed. Um, and it's like a whole idea of like, you know, things will like be sort of cycling over and over again, like universes will get created, destroyed. Uh, but it's like also like 
physics thought experiment. Like this seems related. I, I don't know if she talked about string theory in pr this particular context. So I don't know if string theories relate to the specific one, but I know the string theory has a lot of additional dimensions brought into it in part to like make gravity work because I guess this is like a big source of angst for physicists is making gravity work and that's where you get clappy hands like that to me like she called it bounce I call it clappy hands yeah well she she described it uh, as like an applause uh, at, at, at some point uh, you know as she was working through that delightful um <laughs> yeah <laughs> delightful little analogy she gave us yeah um oh, there's something I was like just thinking about um there was one, I think it was the vacuum decay that reminded me a lot of like in Avengers when everything is getting, like people are getting pulled apart because she describes it as like bubbles. Like there's gonna be little bubbles where physics starts basically dissociating and like we all just kind of like fall apart. And like that to me was very like when Thanos does the thing and like some people just like, like I feel like we fixed, I figured we figured it out. Like that is what's happening. Uh huh. Uh huh people's Higgs fields were changing, but yeah. only in a very localized context. <laughs> but like very uh, good. Yes. Great. <laughs> that's that's what Marvel intended <laughs> all yes. along. I that makes perfect sense. I'm sure of it. Um it definitely tracks. So yeah, those are those are the ways the universe can end. <laughs> those are your options. Um, yeah, the bright side is that the human better. race seems determined to like ruin this planet first. Yeah. So. Yeah. The the none of these things hum, humans almost certainly will be gone long before any of this. So it's fine. Uh, but if you were a living thing around for one of them, like. I like then there was uh, the now I'm I'm this is like I'm I'm forgetting in what what uh, of the possible end of end of all things scenarios this came up in but she was talking about the guy who um, there was there was one scientist okay who was like maybe at some point we you know humanity will innovate enough that we can be sort of like constantly traveling and like stay ahead of the expansion um but then the math says nope <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. no <laughs> not possible <laughs> yeah so. yeah the thing is too I, is like i bet there is a companion to this book that is how do we like avoid any of these fates and there's like probably like a wormhole or something involved i don't know i don't mm -hmm. understand enough but like at some point, if humanity survives long enough, it's gonna have to like trust the physicist to get us there. Yes. To get us to the wormhole that's yeah. gonna protect us somehow. Yep. Trust the scientists. <laughs> what if we did that? What if we did that one? Uh, anyway. Seems like <laughs> not a source of resentment at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it seems like, I feel like vacuum decay to me is the most exciting one where like, because it's so weird. Um, when I say exciting again, like that is one of the ones that theoretically could happen at any moment. Like if uh, there's a quantum tunneling thing that can happen apparently, like where it can just be rude and like our whole Higgs field changes and that changes all of the laws of physics at once. But like, I feel like if we're going to go out, I feel like undermining the fundamental laws of our physics. Yes. To me feels like poetic. The, when she was talking about like objections to, uh, <laughs> to like the, the hadron collider and stuff, I was just like, I, all of these things that you're saying, like we might break physics, uh, yeah. I, like all of that sounds to me like, yeah, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like years of resentment with physics, like fuck mechanics, fuck Newton, fuck Einstein, get rid of it all. We're going to destroy all these equations and just go out. <laughs> like drop the mic and we didn't even do anything like <laughs> unless it turns out we did do something mm -hmm. but this sounds like this is a thing that's going to happen apparently vacuum decay is not going to happen as much as like I'm rooting for that one like yeah. we need like what like microscopic black holes or like a fuck ton of energy mm -hmm. um and 
Or quantum tunneling. Yeah. In my notes, I've said the cold comfort is it probably won't ever be able to trigger our energies that high unless quantum tunneling or microscopic black holes, mm -hmm. which apparently are cute. That was another thing that I learned is that if you're a physicist, microscopic black holes are a cute thing. Um, they sound adorable. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, uh, yeah. Um, unfortunate because, uh, yeah, I'm also I'm also very heavily, yeah, team team vacuum decay. That's um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All of you watching, if you want to vote for your favorite, you can't do anything with your votes. Right. Um, and hopefully there's no like physics overlord who is like, cool, we have registered their preferences. Mm -hmm. We're going to we're going to speed this process up. But mm -hmm. um, between what was it? Universe contracting and so setting space on fire, heat death, which is like void of radiation. Big rip, which is a variation of heat death, which we don't completely understand. Vacuum decay, ruining the laws of physics, or bouncing different dimensions off of each other. Those okay. are your options. I I take it back. Bouncing. I, yeah, I gotta <laughs> I gotta go bouncing. I gotta go big, I gotta go big applause. I yeah. Gotta, uh, big cosmic applause. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I take it back. I'm 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 team bounce. Um, okay, if, if I were casting a preferential ballot, vacuum decay would be number two. But. Yeah, ranked voting is important. Massachusetts yeah. did not pass ranked voting, and this has like been like a sore spot for me. And this is reinforcing <laughs> that. I don't yeah. know if we were gonna use it for this, yeah. but yeah. Okay, we got a question on what's so different about a microscopic black hole from a regular black hole, and that's a really great question that I am going to quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> try to figure out um because i think i had so so okay so basically the point is that black holes form um with larger masses so they're the result of like a large star collapsing and we cannot form tiny black holes like we can't form um, black holes out of smaller things. Um, I'm going to guess it has something to do with like that mass and energy. Like maybe there's something about you need a large amount of mass to create like enough energy to form a black hole. I'm not completely sure about that. Um, black holes are not my strong suit. Um, she was also saying, if I recall correctly, while you are looking it up, but that it like, it, if it were possible, it would have already been happening and mm -hmm. it is not like it has no no consequence and therefore it's this it amounts to the same thing like either it's impossible or like it's happening and it's irrelevant uh yeah yeah Yeah, and so black holes can lose mass um, via a thing called Hawking evaporation, but that's going to take a long time. I think Hawking evaporation is a thing that he made up particles for, which he didn't fully want to call apart. Sorry, I'm not going to go into it because we're going to then end up at the limits of my knowledge. But there's a whole thing there about like particles evaporating um, at the edge of black holes. Um, so yeah. But the point is that if you have a, a microscopic black hole, it can basically serve as sort of like a nucleation site for the things that would trigger um, enough energy to cause vacuum decay. Um, and like nucleation sites are kind of fascinating. Like in real world, uh, I learned about this thing um, last year called uh, uh, sugar explosions, where basically you get like a little bit. So it, it well, it's a dust explosion, actually, um, but this has happened with sugar, but like you get like a little bit of dust that ignites and that triggers all of the other dust to ignite and it actually is incredibly dangerous. So like, even though it's just like a particle of dust because of the way these reactions can spread, it can become incredibly dangerous. And this actually happened at a sugar factory where because they weren't following cleaning protocols well enough, um, this like little bit of sugar was able to trigger like a whole explosion, um, just like because of how these things ignite. And so that is, I think, sort of like the similar concept that's sort of happening here um, with vacuum decay, where I think like a small thing happening at this one black hole site can like set off these chain reactions. At least that's the way I understood it, but I don't know completely if that's what it means. That's what we're going with because yeah. I didn't understand it any better than that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, Mari brought up the point about like how excited the author was about the subject. And I love that too, um, especially because like a lot of, I think like excitement is such a weird element of like science writing where like 
it, it weird is like maybe not the right word but especially something like physics where like it's so easy to treat it as like this like emotionless subject where you're just like yes space time is grand and it exists it's like very like nice to like get to i don't know engage with someone who's just like this is cool this is so weird <laughs> this is so cool and also who understands it like i feel like i can be like this is so weird but could i explain it to you like no could not yeah the her enthusiasm made it a really engaging reading experience in spite of my struggles to understand it uh like genuinely impressive how yeah. I was thoroughly engaged the entire time, even though there were large, large stretches of the book that I did not actually understand. Um, I, I also, this is in our in our little document, but your one of your nitpicky notes was about the footnotes. Mm -hmm. I actually loved the footnotes because yeah. one, because a lot of them were funny and they tied back to this, like they were related to her excitement and enthusiasm, but also because I was so often confused, um, they were like, these really discreet pieces of information that I could latch onto and like mm -hmm. process. Yeah. You know, like when they, when they fell in like a, a really, you know, involved explanation, it was like, oh, that's a fun little aside. Yeah. I understood it. Yeah. I think that's almost why I didn't want them to be a footnote. I almost wanted them to be in the text because like mm -hmm. I felt like, like some of, I don't know if this is true or not, but there's part of me that was like wondering if like if those things were kind of more fleshed out in the text like there would be i don't know like more of a a set of breaks between all of that information but just like baked back more and i don't know if this makes sense but for some reason to me having it as a footnote was distracting because like okay and now i gotta look away then go back whereas like mm -hmm. i felt like there could have been like a nice flow especially a lot of the anecdotes like that she was kind of employing were like fun things that were like pretty re relevant and like i understand why she might want to cut it out but like i was kind of like yeah i could also I could spend like, you know, a few, a few paragraphs on this, like learning about it. And so if they hadn't been in a footnote, they could have maybe been more integrated, but that's like a really nitpicky note. I feel like on my end, cause I still enjoyed them. I also think too, though, that like, I think that even if that, even so, like, I think this book is really short by design. Like, I think yeah. it, it feels like, again, because there's a lot of physics here, right. That it's like, it's, how, like keeping it compact on purpose so that yeah. you know if, if it were much longer than this I True. feel like it would be a lot easier to be to feel overwhelmed by it yeah um, so I also to the note about the speaking about the footnotes I as always also was listening to the audiobook and it was really interesting um the flow they were they made like very individual and specific footnote by footnote decisions about how and when about when they were going to insert them in the audio narration so like sometimes it was like it, it the footnote happened you know like literally okay here's star then she started reading it other times like they finished the paragraph um and then they started reading it it was always super interesting, interesting. though uh because it was like it always made sense to me why they made the choice that they made, but it was like, it's clear that they were making this choice, like actually on a case by case basis, rather than just like, okay, you know, you read the footnote when you get to it or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought so that- So did they like so say like footnote? Like- No, no. So if you were only listening to the audiobook, so anybody, if you only listen to the audiobook, you have no idea that there were lots of footnotes in this book, yeah. maybe. Uh, cause they, but they, you any, do know the footnotes because it seems like they brought them in. Yes, every, every footnote was read by the audiobook narrator. A couple of them had sort of like a tone to them where you could you could probably infer, you might be mm -hmm. able to guess a footnote in the book, but yes, all, all of the footnotes were also read by yeah. the narrator, so. Interesting. I wonder like who made that choice? Like was that on the, the narrator's end of like I think this makes sense here or like was the editor like okay these want yeah like what, at what point that did is, they yeah, that's my big question too I like I yes that's that's uh separate from all of the 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 space stuff that yeah. is something I was struck by when I finished reading this book that's really interesting just in general because I feel like that is like a big thing in nonfiction. like if we're going to go to the big picture nonfiction book club stuff is like how do you record like a nonfiction audiobook that has a lot of footnotes because a lot of them mm -hmm. have a lot of footnotes um, yeah, like they're you can't like they are they're part of uh they're part of the book so. yeah and and they are like and, and 
first of all, you're not writing a nonfiction. Like if you're writing like a nonfiction podcast, you are writing directly for the audio. Whereas if you are writing a nonfiction book, you're not writing with the intention of it being turned into an audio book. So like, yeah, like who makes that choice? Someone tell me. Yeah, <laughs> <makes> <laughs> That's yeah, it's it, it feels like it feels like Katie Mack would have been involved in this just yeah. because of how organic the choices felt. Like yeah. every one of the choices felt correct to me about where like it, it it threw me at first just because like I did not always know yeah. <laughs> when to expect it. Um but like I yeah, they all they all felt like yeah that was correct. That was you needed to finish that paragraph and then you could go back and, and add this thought or like that was a thought that needed to be said right yeah. away. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. That's really interesting. Um, so we've got like ten minutes left. So we, I think we can do our like how do we feel about the book thing? And if anyone wants to add any thoughts or add any questions, anything else you want us to talk about, anything you want me to quickly, frantically Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Um, but yeah, what? how'd you feel about the book? I liked it. Um, I, yeah, like generally speaking, I liked it. I think that I, there are ways in which the book like wasn't really for me just because my, not only both knowledge and interest in physics is just yeah. so low that like you like yeah th there were places where like the, anything that I didn't like about this book wasn't about the book it was about me you know yeah. like me and the relationship with the material yeah. um, but broadly speaking I like the the writing was delightful um, and I I like I enjoyed I don't know just like the 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 I generally enjoyed this experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm in a, a similar place of like, well, so I think I got, I actually got more physics out of this than I like would have expected. And like, I think it helped that I had sort of like a background experience of physics of not like I understand physics, but like familiarity with like some of the concepts. Um, so I actually like, I, I expected to enjoy this book on the side of like in like learning about the universe. I didn't necessarily expect to enjoy it for the physics. And I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it for the physics um, and kind of being like at the end of like each chapter, like turning to my husband and being like, did you know <laughs> this thing? And then he would ask me a question and be like, so what does that mean? I'd be like, I don't know, but did uh, you know? I just told you the extent of what I know. Yeah. Uh, get excited with me. And yeah. And so there was a lot of that that was really, really fascinating. And I think in general, like space to me is just so wild and I don't get it. So like that was like a really, a really good experience. I feel like this is one of those books that I would always think like I should read it and never get around to reading it. So I'm glad that like this is the context that I chose to read it in because I also needed to process it. Um, yeah, there's like a whole separate conversation probably about like what is the right audience for this book because I'm kind of like the physics is like, I think she did a really good job of breaking down the physics to the extent that is like possible to break down the physics, but there's always going to be that kind of like point at which like the physics is just hard because it's physics and it's like a very different way of thinking. And so I'm like kind of curious, like not that we're going to answer this question, but just like in a big picture setting of like, what is, what is the audience for a physics book like this, I guess, mm -hmm. um, because it, it and maybe the the more interesting question that is like if you are someone who really really knows physics is this book still really interesting to you um which it might be because like we all have like even if you're in a field you might have your own specialties and stuff um but like do you still get something out of it like if you know the physics is there still something new is a thing that i'm curious about mm -hmm. and we'll never know alas <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I will not come at this with that physics <laughs> Uh, the point about like you know uh, appreciating reading it in this context uh excuse me i will also say that like this i'm i am also really glad that we read it too because it is another one of those books that um it's like i don't know that our our sort of like guiding idea here like part of why you and i are i mean you're my friend and I like talking to you is, is like, obviously like that's like reason number one, but also like we, we are picking stuff that the other person would never pick. And so like, that's mm -hmm. like, that's also like 
part of the point um, is that our lists are by and large. Um, I think you own one book that I <laughs> on my list. Uh, I, own, I own none books on like, yeah. you know, like our long list that we're, we sort of pick stuff off of, right? Yeah. Uh, so like it's it's exciting because it is definitely the kind of thing that I would not have picked up. I'm, I am like familiar with Katie Mack on Twitter. Um, yeah. I know her as a, as a Twitter person. And so it's like the kind of thing where I would have been like, oh, that seems interesting. Like, but yeah. would never actually take the extra step of like, I will read this. So yeah. um, it's like one of those books that I would have been like, I know that book because I have heard a lot about it. And like, I would assume that somehow that means I've read it. You know what I, like, I don't know if you've had that feeling where like, you've just heard about a book so much where you're like, yeah. Well, uh, I have, and to put a pin in that thought, because, uh, oh, right. yeah. that's a good point. Um, yeah, and so this was, like, a good way of being, like, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it, because, like, first of all, it came out recently, and it seemed really good, and it's also a challenge, like, I feel like it's, it's always good to, to branch out into physics, as much as I hate physicists. It also feels only fair um, that, yeah, that I was this confused after we did uh, Age of Zero. <laughs> That's true. That is very true. At first, I was kind of like, when I was re like getting into the early chapters, I was like, oh, no, like, this feels, like, tough for me. Like, I, I hope, like, everyone else is enjoying this. And then I was like, well, we just did come off a book where I was, like, <laughs> highlighting words just to be like, look this up later. Look this one up later. <laughs> what does this word mean? <laughs> yeah. Balance. Um. Yes, it's true. <laughs> These this this has been very good for for me managing my own ego. <laughs> it's like you think you know shit, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, then on that note, we talk about our book for next time. Yes. Yeah. So to. Per Deboki's point about uh, feeling like you've read a book, um, this is the oldest book that we have have read. Uh, next time we are reading the the Managed Heart. The this is obviously a recent reprint of this book, uh, but the, uh, the Managed Heart uh, commercialization of human feeling by Arlie Russell Arlie Russell Hochschild. Um, this is. Uh, this is a book that I also de like. definitely have that feeling of like, I have read this, but I have not read this. I have read excerpts from this book meant like throughout, like this book to me is in fact, uh, it's like PDF scans on Blackboard from my professors. That's uh, <laughs> that's like, that's how I know this book because it is like, uh, at least the theories within it are like a staple of modern un like undergrad sociology curriculum specifically the reason though that i i bought the book in the first place because i was like i'm gonna read this but i want to read this i want there's a thing and i want to be able to talk about it but i want to actually read the book cover to cover before i talk about the thing um and that is that this book is where the term emotional labor was coined uh the short version of the thing um and I, that i'm sure we're going to get into at great length uh in a month but is that like conflating talking about the shitty dynamics in your friendships um, and use and referring to that as emotional labor uh, like d d is actually a problem because you are burying the labor component that is yeah. like really, really essential and central to uh, like the meaning of that term. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has, it has, that has implications that we'll talk about yeah. when we talk about this book. But so anyway, next time the managed heart commercialization of human feeling. I have a feeling that I've, I have read more recent books of hers, like actually cover to cover too. Um, and generally I have found her writing really like accessible. So I'm mm -hmm. hoping that it's not going to be uh, <laughs> like a repeat of last month. And if it isn't, that's fine. We're just going to escalate this. <laughs> we're going to every book, we're going to make it harder and harder. We're just like going to be daring each other at some point to read it. Yep. Yep. Anyway, well, that's what we're doing uh, uh, on December 12th, same time on my channel. Yep. That's cool. it. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next month.